know, I feel, and therefore will say now, how grateful I am to all of you for the work that you do for my community. Um, and my community is not just Austin or Central Texas, it's Texas. I know that there's stakeholders and shareholders in various good things in communities from all over the state here in this room. Uh, we are at a time, you know this, when the, the share of support from government, however you define that, uh, to do a lot of the work that you all do, that you once upon a time augmented and now have got to shoulder the great burden, that share is down. And it puts enormous stress on your organizations and on the people in this room who are leaders of those organizations, it puts particular stress on you. Um, that's not something that most people realize or appreciate or think to say to you, but I want to say to you that I feel your pain. And I appreciate so much the, that, you, that you work as hard as you do on everyone's behalf. And the nonprofit communities uh, represented in this room and people not in this room are really doing the heavy lifting for the state of Texas right now. And I'm afraid that the direction we're headed is going to get worse before it gets better, if it gets better at all. So thank you very much for the work that you do. I really appreciate how hard you work on behalf of everybody in the state. Uh, I, I feel enormously lucky to consider myself one of you now. For the last two years uh, running the Tribune, I've lived my life uh, happily, uh, blissfully ignorant of the good things about being in a nonprofit world. Uh, uh, as a, a for-profit guy. Uh, for all those years, we heard Mark allude to at Texas Monthly, 18 years in total, eight years as editor, a year as president and editor-in-chief as I was attempting to land my personal plane safely and figure out what I was going to do next. Uh, ended up, as you'll hear in a second, uh, uh, running a nonprofit, somewhat by accident, um, but have been elated to do it uh, ever since and have really come to appreciate what it takes to succeed in the nonprofit world. I don't consider what we're doing to be a success yet. I think you always have to say succeeding but not yet a success because you're not ever really there. The work never stops. Uh, but I'm proud of the work we've done. My colleague Barbara Nags, our COO, is here. And the, the 30 plus people who now uh, occupy the Texas Tribune staff all work enormously hard uh, alongside me. This is not a one person effort. As you all know, the efforts that your organizations undertake are group efforts to succeed. It takes that. Uh, but being in the nonprofit world these last few years has been a real eye opener and a real pleasure, and I've enjoyed swinging at the ball every day to try to do good for Texas, as you all have done for so many years. And I've learned a little bit about what is required, and particularly from the standpoint of fundraising, and and from building a budget and building a revenue model that can sustain itself. You know that that is not something that is easy to do. We all think if you just show up, people are going to give you money, and in the perfect world that might happen. Um, but the fact is that's not. The case and coming out of the for-profit world as I did and partnering with uh, the chairman of our board John Thornton who is a, a venture capitalist he's one of those rapacious profiteers who profit from the misery of others um, <laughs> if he were here he would say the same thing uh, uh, I think what we know is that uh, uh, that if you come to the table with a for-profit mentality it might shape the way that you do anything and especially if you take on the task of running a nonprofit some of the lessons from the for-profit world might leach over into the way you approach your job now. So uh, what I'm going to share with you uh, uh, over the next little while is what we've learned over the last two years and how we've taken the for-profit lessons that we've honed over those many years before and applied them in this particular instance, not promising that any of it applies to your work. It might. They're just the things that we found to be interesting and, and as, as takeaways. Uh, uh, I'm not going to assume that you know about the Tribune, uh, so I'm going to give you the brief log cabin story. Mark was kind to Google it. Um, others of you may choose to do that. We are a digital news organization. You find us principally at texastribune.org. <laughs> young, young Mr. Weiss needs to touch me in a non-threatening way. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you, you find us principally on the web at texastribune.org. Uh, but that's not the only place you find us, as you'll hear in a second, if you live in Texas and you get your New York Times on Fridays, today, Sundays and you have that annoying sticker on the front page of the paper, that's because of us. We publish stories in the New York Times Texas pages twice a week. Uh, they asked us to be part of a project they're doing to publish regional journalism just in the editions in those regions, and we've been very proud to do that. You'll also find our stuff in newspapers around Texas through free syndication on radio stations and television stations. You'll find our events in your communities, and increasingly I think you'll see us in your communities with events. Uh, you'll learn about us in a variety of ways, and I hope that uh, what you find is positive. Uh, we are, as you heard Mark say, a, a news organization that focuses really on three things, public policy, politics, and government. 
uh, those deep verticals. And they're verticals that need someone to be paying attention to them at all times. The basis for this organization was the realization that once upon a time, the for-profit media organizations, mostly the newspapers of this state, would tee up the issues that mattered to all Texans. And as a result of their efforts in bringing them to our attention, we would then begin a conversation community-wide at our dinner tables, around the water coolers of our offices, in the locker rooms of our gyms, about the things that mattered. Public education, higher education, immigration, energy, criminal justice, all the big uh, topics that affect every single one of us. They're not Democratic issues. They're not Republican issues. They're not rural issues. They're not urban issues. They're Texas issues. Those ones I've named and others used to be the stuff of the conversations that we had every single day with our loved ones and our friends and our neighbors and people in our offices and, and all that. But over time, what's happened is the coverage of those issues has diminished. It's been a, a necessary consequence of the decline in the media economy. And this is not something that you probably don't know inherently, but let me just say it. When I moved to Texas uh, 20 years ago, in 1991, there were two daily newspapers in Dallas, two in Houston, two in El Paso, two in San Antonio. There were three times the number of reporters at the Capitol then as there are today. And if you get your newspaper on your doorstep today, you know that it's wafer thin. It used to be fatter, not necessarily fat, but fatter. There were more pages, there were more reporters, and there were more newspapers. There was inherently, as a result of that, more coverage of these issues. And, you know, radio stations, TV stations, they had reporters who covered this stuff. Dan Rather told me when we were getting ready to launch the Tribune that he recalled Back in 1951, he was the capital reporter for the number three news radio station in Houston. Can you ima imagine a scenario in our lifetimes when, first of all, radio actually covered news outside of public radio, when there was more than one radio station that had a news presence in a city, and that Dan Rather was the number three <laughs> station's reporter at the Capitol? Well, the days of that level of coverage, that many venues and that many pages on which to cover this stuff, and that many outlets in general, those days are long past. But the problem is the work that we all need to do as a state to make our state better, work that you are all doing in your organizations, that you're all doing in your communities, that work persists. And in fact, the need for that work is greater than it's ever been before. We have more uninsured Texans than any state has uninsured citizens in the country, not just at the top line, but seniors and working families and children. Our public education system before this legislative session was 44th out of 50 in per student spending. It's now 50th out of 50 after the cuts to public education. We know that as much as we talk about access and affordability and excellence in higher education as worthwhile goals, we are not getting behind those goals with enough of an effort to move kids through the high school to college pipeline to prepare them for the workforce, to prepare them for productive citizenry. We were not doing the hard work on, on higher education. We know that we have a $315 billion road funding hole over the next 20 years just to maintain our roads at the current level of congestion, which means not accounting for what we know is a massive population increase that's not just coming but is here. We know that the cities of San Antonio and Dallas, before the worst one-year drought in the history of this state, were fixing to run out of water in 20 years unless we did something about it. And on and on and on. So exactly at the moment that there were fewer newspapers to report on this stuff, fewer reporters reporting on it, fewer pages and venues in which this stuff would be teed up for all of us to work on, at exactly that moment the problems that the state faces are greater than they've been in, certainly in my 20 years here, and probably in the lifetimes of those of you who've grown up in Texas. And then layer on top of that the fact that the media in the main has sort of fallen into an echo chamber mentality. So that you have Fox World and you have MSNBC World. Equally noxious in my mind, by the way. It's not, <laughs> it's not that I favor one over the other. I, I'm, I'm as turned off by one as I am by the other. And they might occupy on either end of the spectrum, let's say charitably 10%. The 80% of us in the middle get drowned out by the 10% on either side, right? They only occupy a total of 20% of the, of the air waves and the air time and the conversation out there, but they end up occupying our brains more than 20%. And so the problem is people just get turned off. They get turned off by 
that level of divisiveness and partisanship, they get turned off by that level of, of blather. They don't really have places to turn to get reliable, nonpartisan, fact-based information, information that allows them to make better choices. This isn't about telling people what to think. It's about giving them the tools to make better choices themselves, to be more engaged and thoughtful and productive citizens. You heard Mark say that the mission of the Tribune, I know he Googled it because he, he, he read it exactly right, is to raise the level of public, hey, Ellen, how are you? To raise the level of public engagement. <laughs> um, she's heard me talk a lot. She doesn't need to be here for the beginning. That's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, is to raise the level of public, and I'm not going to get a dollar from Stillwater after that. I'm sorry. I just, I just blew it. Uh, is to raise the level of public engagement. And you know, it sounds corny to be talking about public engagement and raising the level of discourse. The reality is that our level of public engagement in this state sucks. And if you measure it only by the degree to which people in this state show up to vote in consequential elections, that, that alone is a sufficient measure of how our level of public engagement sucks. We typically index every time in the bottom 20% of the 50 states in terms of voter turnout. Now, these elections matter. Elections have consequences. Perhaps you've heard that old cliche. It's a cliche because it's true, <laughs> right? The people you send to Austin and to Washington, the 242 people who matter, the 150 members of the Texas House, the 31 members of the Texas Senate, the 29 statewide elected officials, the 32 soon to be 36 members of Congress. What they do and don't do, how they act and don't act, how they vote and don't vote, the way they spend our tax dollars and don't, the actions they take in our interest and not matter. And if you want evidence of that, Exhibit A is the 140 days that concluded at the, well, it was actually more than 140 because they couldn't get the work done in 140. Let's call it 170 days that concluded at the end of June. You want to know whether the work that goes on in that pink building, wherever it is behind me, Matters? Ask yourself about all the changes that have been visited upon Texas as of September 1st. You want to know whether the work that gets done or not done in the Capitol in Washington by our 32, soon to be 36, matters? Ask yourself what's going on in this country right now. Stuff matters. And yet most people in this state have not a clue about what goes on in that pink building down the street or in the Capitol in Washington. They don't have a clue about what their elected officials do. What we have is a scenario in which every two years or four years or six years, the people who are in public office come back home and ask to be rehired. And we have no basis for making an intelligent decision in most instances. And even if we have information, if we find out that our state representative attempted to double bill his expenses to both his campaign and the state, or if we find out that our state representative is driving a Mercedes provided by a contractor with business before the committee that she serves on, we still reelect them. And the reason is we don't know enough about what they do in the main and about their challengers to make an, an intelligent decision. This again is not a Democratic or a Republican issue, it's a Texas issue and it's a Texas problem, right? People think redistricting is the incumbency protection program in this state. It is not. It is lack of engagement. That is the incumbency protection program in this state. And all of you in your communities, with all of your organizations, are dealing with the byproduct of this lack of engagement when it comes to people being returned to office again and again from both parties who continue to act against the interests of the communities that they say they serve. You know this. You know it inherently in your lifetime, you know this. So how does this all come back to the Tribune? How does this breadcrumb back to the Tribune? Well, we looked out at the world and said, if no one else is going to carry the baton of public service journalism, of accountability journalism, of watchdog journalism, and if there is not a for-profit business model to support it, we have to create a nonprofit model. Because what do nonprofits do, after all, is they step in when the rest of the world defaults on its obligation and they find human and financial resources to do the good work for the community that others will not do. And we viewed the work that we were going to undertake with the Tribune to be very much in that same vein, in the same spirit of the work that you all do. Look, the, the media business has survived all these years really based on a three-legged stool. 
Circulation, classified advertising, and display advertising. What has happened over the last 10 years? Circulation has gone to hell because the newspapers made a decision, it seems horrible in retrospect, 10 years ago to give away everything that they do online now, as opposed to making you pay for it and wait for it until tomorrow morning. So the choice that they've been posing for the last 10 years is free and now versus paid and late. <laughs> right? And anything, anything, anything that happens today that you need to know, you know within a minute or two minutes. Why should you wait for the statesman to come tomorrow morning to tell you what you knew today? <laughs> and I think that to some degree, I don't mean to knock the statesman, I love the statesman, and I think the newspapers of this state, especially the big city ones, have the capacity to pivot and move away from simply telling you what happened to why and how and what's going to happen next. And they've, they've figured out a way to recast the work they do to make it more appropriate to this environment. But for goodness sake, free and now versus paid and late. It's not really a newspaper when it hand, lands on your, it's like an old paper, right? <laughs> when it lands on, you could tell I've used that line before. When, uh, uh, when it lands on your doorstep. Because by, by the time you get it, there's nothing new really in it. And so circulation has diminished. I'm surprised it hasn't fallen more than it's fallen so far, but it's fallen. So that revenue stream has been threatened. Classified advertising, we all know, snuck out of the building in the middle of the night, leapt into the arms of <laughs> Craigslist, ne never to return. And that was a pretty significant piece of their revenue for many years, but nobody puts classified ads in papers anymore. And then the last thing is display advertising which is entirely a factor of the health of the economy. So luxury, retail, travel, automotive, those are all sectors that have been enormously hard hit at various points in the last 10 years when the economy has turned down. And what they typically do is, the, is they offload a lot of the ad spend that they were doing with media. James Huffine, some of you know, was the, uh, twice the chair of the UT Board of Regents. He is the son of a now deceased great man who was the patriarch of this sort of family ran these uh, de car dealerships in the, in the mid-cities, in the metroplex. And they were big advertisers as a consequence of, of their car dealerships up there in the Dallas Morning News for many, many years. James was my neighbor uh, for a while, and I would see James, and we'd commiserate about the health of the car business. I was a text monthly at the time in the health of the magazine business. And one September, I think it was 08, I saw it ran into James in his yard on a Saturday morning, and I was complaining that the previous September, when you typically get all the car advertising, was September. You know, the fashion magazines get all the fashion advertising in September. Well, magazines like Texas Monthly get all the car advertising in September. And I was saying to James, you know, last year, when the economy was not yet bad, we did a million three. I think it was a million three in automotive advertising in our September issue. And this year, we did like $58,000. And James said, he said, let me tell you this. He said, my family of dealerships in 07, we spent $5 million with the Dallas Morning News. This year, we spent $500,000. The, the model that the newspapers have relied on for so many years, the three legs, uh, three legs of the stool, uh, have been really uh, uh, obliterated in, in, in a lot of ways. And it's made it very, very difficult for those papers to, uh, to survive. Dallas Morning News had another big layoff this week, 30 or 40 more people. Every one of the papers in this state has had to be left. So the for-profit guys have had to make a calculation. They can only now afford to do some of what they did before. They can only afford really to do stuff that sells. So they have to ask themselves, do we do immigration reform or Colt McCoy's shoulder? Do we do higher ed reform or Brett Favre's sexy text messages? <laughs> right? Do we do transportation or do we do you know, a review of a movie or crime on your street or color, well, color, color weather maps or traffic or what have you. What, and you would do the same thing that they've done. They've said we have to do the stuff that sells and the serious, quote, serious journalism is not stuff that sells as well as the other stuff. And it's not an environment in which advertisers want to see their advertisement run, right? So they've held uh, 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 on for as long as they can, but they've decided that they had to either diminish or in some cases in some of the mid and small papers ultimately just stop entirely covering this stuff. So into that void we step. There's a need, there's an opportunity, and because the for-profit model has been proven not to work to support this stuff, we're going to start a new model, a nonprofit model. I'm going to get into our financials, which I've not really shared with people outside of our operation, but I'm going to share with you today in a couple of minutes. But first, I'm going to give you a very quick tour through the Tribune. 
This is the home page. It was the home page as of yesterday. We have 16 reporters among the 30 odd people on our staff. That makes us between one half and one third of the Capitol Press Corps that remains, is just the Tribune. 16 reporters, people creating content across platforms, people who are subject area specialists. If you look here in the second navigation bar of the two, you see these big super topics, public ed, higher ed, health reform, abortion, death penalty, energy, things that I alluded to in some cases earlier. We have reporters who have those topics as their beats, and they are the most expert reporters in Texas on those subjects, I promise you. And all they're doing, liberated from any other considerations, is focusing on those things and those things alone. But we also have people who cover politics. We cover politics the way ESPN covers sports. We cover the players and we cover the game. Because, you know, for us, this is sports. For us, this has the same, I mean, I know it's serious. Maybe not as serious as college football, but it's serious. <laughs> but, but the fact is, to understand what's going on, you've got to understand what's behind what's going on. And that often involves knowing the people and understanding the process better. And you can make this stuff interesting. It doesn't have to be boring. It can be interesting. And so our charge is to make it as interesting as possible. So we do a lot of original journalism down here in the bottom where it says Tribwire, we built from the very beginning and have continued to do this, an aggregation piece where it's hand curation, not automatic, hand curation. Humans touch this. We look for stories that are about public policy and politics in other media outlets. And we put them all in one place in this Tribwire and you can click on that link and go to that story. It allows you, rather than having to go to 30 or 40 different sites over the course of the day or miss things, it's a one-stop shop. We want to be your big box store for public engagement, right? Just as you go to Target to buy your toilet paper and your Diet Cokes and your picture frames under one roof, we're the place that you should go to get all your public policy and politics and government stuff under one roof. We're the big box store for that stuff. That's the purpose of this aggregation piece. But we do quite a bit more, and I want to share it with you. At the beginning of the Tribune, we were amazed to discover something that, in fact, we probably knew but had never articulated. You could not go to one place anywhere online and get contact information or committee information or staff information or any information about all elected officials in one place. You had to go to different places to get them for different people. And we thought, well, this is absurd. The people who are in that community of interest ought to be able to go to one central location and have all that information be right there. So we built an elected officials directory. Amazing that it had never been done before. OK, fine. So we did it. That 242 I mentioned, 150 House, 31 Senate, 29 statewide elected, 32 Congress, they're all right here. And so if you click on, say, Dan Branch, who is the chair of the House Higher Ed C Committee, state representative from Dallas, future candidate, we think, for something, good guy. Uh, you will find what is typically in everybody's elected officials directory page. You've got his personal information, everything from his birth date, occupation, education, the name of his wife. Every elected official has to file a personal financial disclosure form with the Texas Ethics Commission. We have every single personal financial disclosure form filed by an elected official downloadable as a PDF from their page. Now, I mean, that, that to me is like, that's justification enough to do this. Because in order to understand the work that they're doing and what's not being said or told, you've got to understand the ways in which they have financial entanglements and follow the money and the whole thing. And so we thought, well, that stuff is public. It's just not all in one place. And in fact, if you go to the Ethics Commission, you kind of have to, it's like old school. You have to go and request them one at a time and photocopy them and then return that one and then get another one and one at a time. And so we just basically said, OK, kid, whoever the kid was at the time, go to the Ethics Commission, see you in December. <laughs> and just basically get all of them, and we're going to digitize them, and we're going to put them all up online because that's the public's right. It's a public good. So we have all those. All the election information for the member, uh, office information, committee assignments. If you look on the bottom, we constantly update the members of their staff, and every staff member's name is a clickable link that opens a mail form in your email program. So if you want to communicate on behalf of your group, your cause, with a member of, a, of, a, of an elected official staff who might have purview over your issue, this is an easy way for you to go directly to that person. Because this is the 21st century, we have his Twitter feed, we have his Facebook page. You can click on those and either follow or fan him. 
We aggregated real time every elected official's Twitter feed on their page as well. I mean, it's just, for, for wonks, this is like every day is Christmas, right? I mean, it's just, it's just great. If you click on the district number, we have a page for the district. And what you really can't see here, it's not a very good use of the, of the, of the medium of PowerPoint here, I'm afraid, is a Google map of the district, but down there where it says district profile, it's PDF after PDF after PDF with all kinds of demographic information about the district, income profile, household profile, education, workforce development. I mean, truly more information about the district that you could possibly want. And this is for every single district in addition to every single elected official. I mentioned that sub nav bar that has all those super topics. Well, for each one of those, what we've done is aggregated all the content under that topic that we have published since the beginning in one place. So if you're a higher ed person, and that's all you care about, you just bookmark this page and we have all of our higher ed stuff under one roof. Or if you're a health reform person, if you're following the conversation about health reform, again, all under one roof. If, like those of us at the Tribune who are total masochists, you pig out on the presidential race, we have built a peripedia where everything about Rick Perry that we have ever published and every bit of information we've been able to get our hands on about his donors, about his background, about his politics, stop hissing. Uh, <laughs> everything you could possibly want about this man is right here in one place. And partly for our uh, purposes, this was for the benefit of the people who read the Tribune, but it was also a resource for them out there who inevitably are parachuting in for 12 hours and then filing their story from the business center at the Austin airport who don't know anything about Texas, <laughs> who don't know anything about, about Perry, but who are going to show up here and explain Texas to the rest of the world. We know that there are many things in the world we do not like in Texas, but the thing we like least is non-Texans explaining Texas to the rest <laughs> of the world. So we figure we better step up and provide that level of, of transparency and knowledge and resource on behalf of the rest of the world. And that's the case here. So I encourage you to avail yourself of, of those and other topic pages. We have been big proponents since the beginning in data as journalism. You know, there's a lot of public information out there in the world, out there in the world, and most people don't know that it exists. They don't know that they're entitled to it. It is public information. Even if they knew it existed and knew that they were entitled to it, they wouldn't know where to go get it. And even if they knew those other things, they wouldn't know what to do with it. We know that it exists. We know that it's yours, that it's ours. We know where to go get it, and we know what to do with it. And so we've been building these databases of public information since day one. We have more than 60, maybe even at this point more than 70 databases of public information. Everything you could possibly imagine on this site. I'm going to highlight just a couple of the ones that are most interesting and most popular right now. We have more than 667,000 public employees. State universities, state agencies, metropolitan transit authorities, school districts, county appraisal districts, you name it. Anybody paid by taxpayer dollars. It is only 667,000 now. If you are a state employee and you are not in this database, you will be. Our plan is to have every single public employee by, by some date out in this database. We only have 667,000 now, 137 different entities. And the rationale for this is very simple. In the same vein of accountability journalism that I described was the basis for the Tribune philosophically, we believe that how tax dollars are spent is a big deal. How tax dollars go to pay for the salaries of people is a big deal. We as a public have a right to know how those tax dollars are spent, and therefore, we have a right to know how much people are being paid to work on the public uh, dole. Now, this is controversial, right? If you are a public employee, you are probably not enormously psyched <laughs> that your salary is on our website. You are probably even less psyched to discover that when you Google yourself, the first thing that comes up is your salary page <laughs> on the Texas Tribune. As I tell people all the time, we do not control the Google. I have nothing to do with the fact that Google indexes this stuff so high. I do, however, control this. And the basis for it is what I said, transparency, accountability, and all that. Invariably, I'll get a phone call. It'll be 9 o'clock at night. And because I'm very accessible, all my information is on the website. You need to find me night and day. You can find me. And I'll get a call on my cell phone at 9 o'clock at night. Some old boy whose wife is a 
school teacher in the spring school district, let's say, and his wife is mad and has put him up to calling me because they discovered that her salary is on the internet. And I'm always very respectful and patient. Yes, sir, I understand that. This is an invasion of privacy. Well, sir, it isn't. Your wife is a public employee. She's paid with public dollars. It's public information. It's not an invasion. Ah! Whip, slam. And, and often, often the hang, the hang up is preceded by a threat to call a lawyer. Well, most of the time I go, we're fine. Some of you may know Laura Prather, who is a lawyer here in Austin, who's now at uh, uh, Sedgwick, but used to be at Jackson Walker. She's a big First Amendment, open government lawyer. Like every 10th one of those calls, I'll hang up and call Laura and go, are you sure? OK. And, she's, and she says, yeah, you're fine. OK. And then I'm, and then I'm OK. But like nine, nine more of those calls, I'm good. And then I, on the 10th one, I call her back in. Um, this has been, not surprisingly, enormously popular as a feature of our site. A huge amount of our traffic comes to us through this database. And it's because it's voyeuristic. Right? Gee, I wonder what my second grade teacher makes, right? But also, as a practical matter, the way I really believe this, I'm not sure I've been able to sell this as hard. If you are working in a state agency and you want to know what the person down the hall who does your same job makes, you are in a much stronger position to negotiate on your behalf with the knowledge that I love the fact that you're nodding. Please come with me all over the state. Uh, it's good. Uh, uh, people are then aware of what people who are doing the same job are making. And it, I just think that there's value in this information being out in the world. I will simply say it is a very, very popular feature of our site. Uh, we, are, uh, we don't just discriminate against the little guy. We also discriminate against lobbyists. We have a database that aggregates all the lobby registration information in one place so you can see with complete transparency which lobbyists are working on behalf of which uh, corporations, which causes, how much money they're spending, on what, with whom, I mean, total blow the doors off transparency on that. And we love that very much. Two more things that may be of interest to all you good community people here. During the session when the conversation went from 10 billion in public ed cut to 6 billion down to 5 billion, then ultimately to 4 billion, in the abstract, cutting money is easy. But when you're cutting my education money, now it gets complicated. And for a lot of the members and a lot of the people around the state, who heard this discussion of cutting education money, it was all in the abstract. We said to Scott Hochberg in the House and Florence Shapiro in the Senate, who managed the so-called runs, the spreadsheets, of what the impact of the cuts would be, give us your numbers. Now again, the public never had access to this information in previous fights over these kinds of cuts before. But we said, you know what, if you're going to cut an unprecedented amount of money from public education, which, by the way, affects every single person in every single community, in every single county, all across the state, wouldn't it be a good idea for the people out there to know what those cuts will actually mean to their school districts and to their schools? So we built a database in which the 1,024 affected school districts around Texas, for each of them you could put in your school district, and up would come, here is how much, in real dollar terms, and on a percentage basis, your school district is going to realize a cut. And it was at that moment in the session, I'm not saying it was because of our database, that all of a sudden people were going, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. We actually thought that during her filibuster, Wendy Davis was reading from our database. I mean, we were, it was really an interesting moment to see what greater transparency on the effect of these cuts did to the legislative process. You know that whole idea of how sunshine is the greatest disinfectant? I prefer to think of it as cockroaches when the flashlight's on them. But in any case, <laughs> what, what, happens, what happens with greater transparency is people just look differently at the consequences of the work they do. Good thing, right? So we did that. Now we've just done, it's the 1.0 version. I mean, it is going to be so great. It is going to be so tricked out by the time this is done. We've just launched a massive public education database that allows you to search for your school and to either look at your school or ideally to take your school and compare it to other schools. Automatically compares your school to its own performance the previous year, to the remainder of its district, and to the state average on everything from academics to demographics to school spending to staffing. I mean, it is just for, for people who care about this stuff and who want accountability in the way public education dollars, what remain, are spent who want to be able to just drum up enthusiasm in your local community to make your school better, 
this is such a, I'm so proud of the fact that we have done this. It is a great resource. And let me tell you something, it is only the beginning. For the next year, we're going to be building this out, building this out, building this out, so that by October of next year, this thing is going to be the most awesome compendium of public education statistics that you could possibly want. And the business community and the foundation community and the education community will all be behind this because they know that it is only through this level of accountability that change happens. And I am thrilled to death about this. In addition to data, we also do events. You will, I will just encourage you to look at the events page on the Tribune site. You'll see all kinds of events that we do on a regular basis. This morning I did a public conversation with Ted Cruz, the Republican candidate for Senate, where we talked about the debt ceiling and talked about whether Social Security is a Ponzi scheme. Apparently it's not. Um, and, a whole, and a whole range of stuff. But I want to in particular direct your attention here to an event we're doing in two weekends on this very campus with this very conference center as the base camp. Patterned after the Aspen Ideas Festival, although they have the phrase Ideas Festival trademarked, so they're both lowercase as I say it, small i, small f. Um, it's the Texas Tribune Festival, four tracks of content over the two days happening concurrently, public and higher education, race, immigration, and the border, energy and the environment, and health and human services. More than 100 people speaking, including John Cornyn and half a dozen members of the congressional delegation, enough members of the legislature to qualify as a quorum, including <laughs> all the relevant committee chairs, <laughs> officials of the Bush and Obama administrations, leaders across academia and industry. It's going to be awesome. And I want to encourage you to check it out. It is going to be a, we'll have about 1,000 people there in attendance over the two days. It's going to be a great event. It will be the true distillation of our efforts to create, to force the public conversation that needs to happen about these big topics. Of course, you can follow us on Facebook or on Twitter because we push all of our content out through the social media channels. We are absolutely unashamed to use social media as a publishing platform because it reaches people, which is important, and I'll talk about that in a second. You can sign up for our email alerts. You can be so lazy that you never go to our website directly, but the content just shows up in your email box every morning. And then you click on the link of a story that interests you. You're not obligated to look at everything, just the stuff that you want. Um, as I mentioned, the Texas pages that we publish, we've been doing this now for almost a year. It has been a magnificent partnership with the New York Times. I worried like hell when we did this deal that the Times would be so onerous and so burdensome, this relationship, and that we would spend all of our time on this and none of our time on the other stuff, and that it would totally derail the Tribune. The exact opposite has been true. It has made us a better organization, sleeker, more nimble. The quality of our work has increased. The visibility of the Tribune brand is greater. And, and much more important than any of that inside baseball stuff is we are now carrying this important conversation about these issues to a wider audience. Because all of our content appears uh, in the Texas editions of the paper, but is all on the New York Times website around the world. And now with Rick Perry in the presidential race, we're starting to publish in the national edition of the Times. So everybody in the whole country is getting it. And see, that to me is, it shows you, I'll talk about this in a second, the power of collaboration, which is something that a lot of nonprofit people in my lifetime have simply had a hard time dealing with. How do you work with people who set up on paper as your competition? The answer is you no longer have a choice in this environment. And of course, we have a free iPad and iPhone app that I would direct you to download because you get our content that way. So let me give you a quick peek inside the financials of the Tribune. Again, you can't tell anybody about this, right? <laughs> um, but we haven't actually shown this stuff outside of the context of the Tribune. And only a couple slides, but I think they'll be illustrative of what we've done. And some of it, frankly, doesn't necessarily reflect well on us, but I think transparency in all things, including your own business, right? We uh, have budgeted for these first three years, and we're pretty close to it, to spend about $7.5 million to get the Tribune launched. As of this morning, well, Jennifer, this is why I borrowed your pen, because I needed to write the number down. $9,715,284 raised in really just a little less than two years so far. In a terrible economy, the worst media economy you could imagine at a time when the priorities of our communities are so stretched thin and the resources are so stretched thin, we have been able to make the case to individuals, to corporations, to foundations, to the average person that supporting the idea that accountability journalism, public service journalism matters, that's a worthwhile idea. And so we've generated from 
across the state and across this country, more than $9.7 million committed to date. We can do this. This is not a business model that is working the way it's going to ultimately work. I think it's going to only get better, but it's working for now. It's a success for now. This is, I'm, and I'm showing you everything like up to the minute. These are our financials for the year, up to the minute. Major philanthropy, we're blowing the doors off this year as we did last year on a budget of $683,000 to be raised from individuals. We define major philanthropy as gifts of $5,000 or more from individuals. On a budget of 683, we're already at 970 for the year. Foundation support, which is largely restricted foundation support, so the foundation gives us something for the express purpose of our doing something that, but for that foundation support, we would be unable to do. 591,000 was the budget, we're at 722.5. It is skewed a little high because we had a major gift from the Knight Foundation to do some stuff this year that came along with it, requirements that we do thus and such. That number on both sides of the ledger would be lower next year. But again, that's where we are. Membership is a hard thing, let me tell you. And those of you who run member organizations know this. We have built a membership model from scratch in a genre of nonprofits that had no predicate. So we both built the model from scratch and also created the notion of a membership model for an organization like this one. And it's, I, I didn't fully appreciate how hard that was. It's hard. You know, KUT here in Austin is the most successful public radio station per capita in the country. They do $3 million in membership and $3 million in corporate support a year in parts of five congressional districts. They, they are crazy good at fundraising, and their people are super loyal. I think it's 220,000 listeners, 17,000 donors. They convert at a better than 8% rate, which, at least in the magazine business, is about two and a half times better than when you send out direct mail pieces to solicit circulation. It's two and a half times better than what we ever did. And like, you'd get a 3% response and you'd go, oh, thank God. 8%. But you know what? It's working, though, now. Last year, on a budget of 235 for membership, we just barely got over the line of 200,000. And it was like a total all hands on deck effort in the last 30 days. Well, to my amazement, we are going to blow through this goal. I, we haven't even done our fall membership drive yet. We haven't even renewed the majority of our members who, if you think about it, since we started in the fall of 09, about 1,000 or 1,200 of our members were members who started as members in the last three months of the year. So we don't come back to renew them until the last three months of the year. So we're now only getting into the meaty part of the renewal of membership period. And so that number reflects before renewals really have kicked in in earnest. And I'll give John Thornton, the chair of our board, credit for this. Last summer he said, you know, with no basis for saying this, by the way, but he was right. You know, we ought to create elite membership circles with associated benefits that go along with them. But we ought to say to people, if you want to give us a gift more than just a basic membership gift, but you don't want to give us a super big gift, commit to giving us $1,000 a year for three years. We'll call that our editor circle. Or give us $2,500 a year for three years. We'll call that our leadership circle. Or give us $5,000 a year for three years. We'll call that our chairman circle. And I thought, well, all right, it's just like rebranding. I mean, it doesn't actually seem like there's anything to it. God, was it a brilliant idea. <laughs> We're, 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 probably, we're probably somewhere around one hundred and twenty or $130,000 in membership through these circles that are now as a predictable stream of revenue that going into the next year and the next year and the next year, we now know that money is baked into the cake. It's so great. And what it becomes is a consolation prize for rich people. So I go see Mark and I say, Mark, give me $25,000. And Mark says, eh, I don't want to, I don't have it, you're not really my passion, I don't care. To get me out of your office then, just commit to five a year for three years. Oh, I'll do that, fine. <laughs> this, this has happened so many times where it becomes the consolation prize for rich people who want me to get out of their office. <laughs> And I don't, know that I, fully, I don't know that I fully appreciated that it would, would, would play that role, but it turned out to be this brilliant consolation prize. And so from a membership standpoint, we've really built a very, and you know, the other thing about the membership is our basic membership is 35 bucks, household is 60. Our average membership gift is $135 a year. So we're indexing significantly higher on an average basis 
uh, uh, than we had any right necessarily to expect. So that's been really pretty terrific. Um, corporate is a little misleading. The great majority of our corporate stuff happens in the back half of the year, both because we started in the back half of the year and because all the budgets for corporations for the next year we're kind of in planning right now. So we have a ton of stuff out. We're going to make that number. Absolutely, we're going to make that number. On events, we have an events business, as I've said, a strategy that has been magnificent for us. We're on the verge of hitting our budget, and I think we'll actually blow through our budget on events by the end of the year. Uh, Texas Weekly is the premium uh, piece of our business. It's the newsletter of politics that we acquired when we started the Tribune. Again, a lot of this is backloaded in the back half of the year. We're in a pretty big scramble to make that number, and I think we'll come close to making it. And that's how much the New York Times pays us for the privilege of publishing in their paper, $102,000 a year. They started at 75, and I said in my best kind of, you know, hard guy negotiate, don't come back to me unless it's six figures. <laughs> and so they said, so they said okay, $102,000. Okay. <laughs> Some negotiator. Um, but you know what? Honestly, the non-monetary value to us, they're spending half a million dollars over the year to co-brand the Tribune and the Times. Those stickers cost money. And that point of purchase stuff costs money. So they're spending a ton of money to support this collaboration, and it's been magnificent. Uh, Barbara did these charts for a staff meeting. They're so great because they prove my point. Had they, been, had they not proved my point, I would have fired her and not run them today. But actually, no. It's a, they, they prove the point. It's magnificent. So this is how we did income in the first year. And as you can see, we relied so heavily on major philanthropy, 91%. Last year, down to 47% as we diversify the income model. This year, 21%. I mean, this is, this is how, a, and this is where this, we now segue into the for-profit lessons for a nonprofit world part of the speech. From the beginning, we talked about this has got to be a sustainable model, not just as an articulated concept so that foundation people would bat their eyelashes at you. It's actually got to be sustainable. And that means you've got to diversify your source of revenue. You've got to have enough buckets so that if one bucket is not as high at the end of the year as you anticipated, another bucket is over full and is flowing into that bucket. It's got to be. And every single business runs that way. Why shouldn't nonprofits run that way? You can't run an organization of any kind unless you build a model that is truly diverse in its sources of income and is truly sustainable as a result. So that's fabulous. And then from an expense standpoint, as you, it will come as no great shock to you, as we are like a WPA program for journalists right now. We're the only ones hiring in the whole world. Um, you know, 65% of our expense, really that's misleading. I think it's even higher, isn't it, Barbara? It's like more like 75. Yeah, it's more like 75. It's basically, it's like three quarters of our expense is people. But you know what? If you're a donor to the Tribune, you don't want us spending that money on fancy offices. You want us spending that money on people and technology, because that's the product. And at the end of the day, that's what you're donating for, the product. The product is what matters. So we pay the money, pay us the money, it goes out the door in the form of product. And I'm glad that that's been the case. All right, so 10 takeaways since the beginning of time. And this is not brilliant. I prom just spoiler alert, it's not brilliant. <laughs> but their takeaways that to me, as I sat down and thought about this, kind invitation to come speak, what are the things that were lessons that I took away after the two years about applying the for-profit mindset to the nonprofit organization? The first is assume the worst. I have been on the boards of some wonderful nonprofit organizations. And a very act, I'm never not an active board member. I'm always an active board member. If I'm going to do it, I want to offer myself up to you, but I'll also be willing to serve on committees and chair the board or raise money. I've always been an active board member. So I know the inner workings of a lot of these organizations. And I've been on the Austin Film Society board, chaired that board. I've been on the KLRU board, public television here, chaired that board. I've been on, I was on eight years on the, I was on the Blanton Museum board for so long, Jack Blanton had hair when we started. I was on that board. <laughs> Um, I served on the ballet board. I served on the Trinity Episcopal School board. I can go down the list. And what I would always find at budget time is that there was a, comp a tacit understanding that we were going to choose to be optimistic and then worry later in the year when things didn't work out. And I always thought, you guys, I mean, I'm a big believer in f fate and luck. And but the, at the, at the, we have the same conversation in September. And it always begins with the words, oh, shit. <laughs> And, and to, my, to my mind, why go through the exercise of putting yourself in a situation where in September you're going to say, oh, shit? Why not just plan 
for the absolute worst at the beginning. S said another way, I would rather be pleasantly surprised than mortally disappointed. And I would rather budget in such a way that I'm so conservative in my projections of revenue and so liberal in my, ex my projections of expenses that I'm setting myself up to succeed as opposed to fail. And this may be a for-profit thing. Maybe it's what you do if you run a magazine like Texas Monthly. You totally sandbag your budget so that you look really good for the people who own the company. Maybe you do it because you frankly are worried about the things you can't control. And it's better to be safe than sorry. In my experience, that's the best approach. So when I say assume the worst, I will tell you that when we built the budget for the Tribune at the beginning, we were very conservative on revenue and very profligate on expenses as we projected them out based on what we knew at the time. For instance, we said after the launch of the Tribune, we're going to get not a dollar from foundations for the next three years. Now, obviously, that was never going to be the case, and it hasn't been the case. And as you saw, we're plus $700,000 in foundation support just this year. But the point was to prepare us for austerity, prepare us for the worst, really give us the motivation to hit what were numbers that could be hit, goals that could be hit, as opposed to having to scramble in September and say, oh, shit. And I don't know that that's necessarily a, a, a for-profit mindset perfectly, but that was my mindset coming out of the for-profit world, coming into this world. The second thing is you've got to put a for sale sign on everything. And let me tell you what, working with journalists who came from newspapers where you know their, in their integrity is the currency of the realm, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> You know, oh, you can't possibly, we can't possibly have a sponsor for that. That would look bad. We can't, oh, you can't possibly, no, yes, we can. Here's the thing. You never compromise your integrity. Never, ever, 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 ever. Never. Never let anybody control anything. You control it. Never give away your principles. Never, ever, ever compromise your core principles. But for God's sakes, you've got to run this as a business, which means revenue promiscuity. You've got to look for opportunity, truly. You've got to look for ways to bring in money. And you've got to do it the way that you knew going in you were going to do, but you've got to make up a bunch of stuff along the way. You've got to be willing to innovate. You've got to be willing to try stuff and fail. A fail fast model, which is absolutely from the for-profit world, from the technology world, has got to be layered on top of what you do. No recriminations. Anything that you can try in service to greatness is worth trying, and if it fails, move on. Don't get caught up in what didn't work. Move on. Try something else. We have been willing to reinvent, in a lot of ways, the traditional approach to public media. You know, hell yes, we're going to do corporate sponsorship. Hell yes. Hell yes, we're going to allow uh, 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 interested parties to sponsor areas of content. Yes, we're going to have people sponsor our email message. I remember, th this is where I, I go back to the for-profit mentality. Uh, years ago, four, four or five years ago, my son was probably you know, five or six at the time. We were in Houston, and we were at NASA, and he's crawling around on some m massive plastic moon rock or something. And I'm sort of bored standing around while he's doing this, and I'm looking at my phone, and I see that ESPN had at that point started to allow you to sign up for your favorite teams, if you have a favorite team, you tell them your favorite team, and then every time your favorite team is playing, they send you a text message or an email. And then every time your team scores, they send you a message. So I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. Okay, fine. So I sign up. So I get a message that day. Okay, your team is playing. And at the bottom it says, presented by Gillette. And I went, cling. Well, my, my thought was, well, why the hell shouldn't that be sponsored? Right? I mean, why, well, it's a perfect opportunity to make money. And so when we came in here and started doing email alerts, I was like, and we got to have sponsorship of email alerts, and we have to have sponsorship of this, and you got to put a thing on that, and you got to sell that, and we got to, and, and I mean, we literally have been willing to put a price tag on anything. That, at, up to the point at which it compromises our integrity. And, and you know, you got to move people in your organization off of this idea that it somehow is so diminishing of your purity, and oh my God, no, stop, stop that. We're running a business here. You want to continue to get paid? You want to keep the doors open? You want to keep the lights on? Run the damn thing as a business. Think about it as, I've got to bring in money, and I'm going to do everything in my power to keep this organization humming along as long as it doesn't compromise the integrity of this place or, or somehow abrogate the mission that we put forward. Got to do that. For sale sign on everything. And I'm unashamed of that, It'll, absolutely. The, the this path to sustainability thing I, re I, I referred to earlier is very important. 
It is not just that when I go to Jennifer Esterline on behalf of KDK, or I go to Ellen Ray on behalf of Stillwater, or I go to Larry Faulkner on behalf of the Houston Endowment, or anybody else, it's not just that when I walk in the door, I walk in with a stronger weapon in my arsenal if I can document that I have a plan for us to be sustainable in a period of time, that we can pay our bills, that we're not going to constantly come begging. Right? That I don't have one rich person I've tricked into funding my entire operation. That's a disaster. You know, ProPublica, which is a great, great nonprofit media organization, nonetheless gets the great majority of its funding from this nice couple, the Sandlers, who owned Countrywide Mortgage before it went hinky a couple years ago. And they give ProPublica, I believe, $10 million a year. That is the, every year. That is the basis for ProPublica's operations, is the Sandlers. Well, the Sandlers are going to get hit by a bread truck, or they're going to die, or they're going to decide they like some other cause. It is a non-starter to have one rich person be your entire revenue stream, because tomorrow they may not be. And so you've got to build a model that is sustainable, that, is, that allows for different sources of revenue, and that if one source is down or goes away, other sources can rise up and fill that bucket. And if you don't do that, then you're setting yourselves up for failure. You may get lucky and not have to worry about that. But I think that's such a risky strategy. And so, and, and so again, practically speaking, it's important. But selfishly, when I go to Ellen or I go to Larry Faulkner, that's what they're going to ask for. I went to a meeting at the Knight Foundation in Miami about a year ago where there were about a dozen grantees around the table. And I, I'll never forget this. One of the grantees of the Knight Foundation is the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the foundation arm of Wikipedia. And this woman, she must have been 90 pounds in a sweater dress, you know, with goth hair and weighed like a, you know, nothing. And she's sitting at the end of the table and she's quiet the whole time. And at some point somebody says, we're talking about giving money to other organizations. And somebody says, well, I think, of course, that one of the things that the Knight Foundation ought to require is a path to sustainability. And this little woman, she raised her hand and she goes, first time she's spoken, she says, I'd like to make an argument against sustainability. And I thought to myself, I'm sure you would. <laughs> But you know, here in the real world, here on planet Earth, we who are in the nonprofit sector have an obligation to go to our funders, whether it's for five bucks or five million dollars, and demonstrate that we can actually do this. And so as much as this may seem like a no-duh thing, I, I still think for a lot of people, you've got to build a model that points you quickly towards sustainability, and you've got to be able to document what that means. This is kind of like the second half of that volume, volume, volume. I'll never forget this. So we were getting ready to do corporate sponsorship of the Tribune. And like everything else at the Tribune, we plucked it completely out of the air. And so how much should we charge people to be a corporate sponsor of the Tribune? I don't know, $5,000. Great, $5,000. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't even know what it means, but just charge them $5,000. Great. So we're getting ready to do this. And one of our board members is Steve Adler, who if some of you are in the Austin nonprofit world, maybe know Steve. He's a terrific lawyer. He's on a lot of great nonprofit boards. He co-chaired the ballet's uh, capital campaign. Great guy. So Steve Adler's on board. Steve Adler said, look, I've been through this sort of thing before, and I want to tell you, I think you're making a mistake. $5,000 is a big psychological hurdle, if not to say a big financial hurdle, for a lot of businesses to get over. You know, you charge JP Morgan, or you charge Fulbright and Jaworski, you charge Accenture $5,000, they're going to go, you know, flick the lint off their shoulder. But if you go to Dave Shaw's public affairs consulting firm and you ask them for $5,000, they're going to go, well, you know what, we're actually kind of a small shop, we're trying to build our business, blah, blah, blah $5,000. So Steve said, here's what you should do. Cut it in half. Make it $2,500. That way, for the big guys, it's a chip shot, but the little guys can feel better about playing. The little guys can play alongside the big guys. And in terms of corporate sponsorship, if everybody's paying the same thing, it's literally going to be JP Morgan, Accenture, Frost Bank, Dave Shaw. And it's basically, it's basically going to all be same, 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 same. And, they said, and he said, trust me, I just have this instinct. You're going to make up in volume what you lose in dollars. And God was he right. I mean, it was one of the greatest things that I had got as a piece of advice at the beginning of the Tribune. Volume, volume, volume. You are going to do so much better if you lower the bar and level the playing field for your funders and let everybody get in. Let everybody get in. It didn't affect us with the big guys at all because the big guys were like, well, hell, that's fine, no problem. I mean, literally, the big guys 
is like, it wasn't even a conversation with the big guys. $2,500, that's like dinner at the headline. It's fine, you know, <laughs> done. But for the little guys, it really was an opportunity to bring in, you know, sole proprietor law firms and the Dave Shaws of the world and a lot of people who otherwise would not have had the opportunity to get the exposure that we've been able to give them. I think it's been a great thing. Volume, volume, volume. Everybody is your development team. This is absolutely not something I fully appreciated, and you in the nonprofit world for a long time maybe have figured this out. I did not. The CEO is your development director. The development director is your development director. The guy who picks up your recycling is your development director. Every single person at a nonprofit has got to take ownership of the fundraising piece. This is not all on the development director. It's everybody. And I will tell you, I have worked, again, as a board member at organizations where the fundraising budget was enormous at the beginning of the year, and when it came time to, to discuss, can we make that number, everybody in the room just turns and looks at the development director and closes. <laughs> you know what? Everybody ought to look at themselves. We have taken the position with the Tribune that there is not a single person in that building who does not have ownership over fundraising. Everybody owns the fundraising piece. That doesn't mean that you co-opt or somehow corrupt somebody who has a function where it would be inappropriate for them to, of course, not literally everybody. But everybody who is in the position of being able to help run the business has got to be in a situation where they take ownership for fundraising because it doesn't happen unless it's a group effort. It's an all-in deal. I spend half my time, I'm editor-in-chief and CEO. I say not without accuracy, editor-in-chief in the morning, CEO in the afternoon. I'm literally raising money every single day. Barbara came on in April as our COO. Barbara has been absolutely in, in, instrumental in helping us, principally from foundations, but Barbara has been absolutely instrumental in raising money. We have a terrific development director whose history includes a stint at the Austin Museum of Art, and she has been terrific at, she is in there raising money. Our development director is in there raising money. Everybody is in there raising money because it never stops. It's like Indiana Jones being chased by the boulder. You all know that, right? That's what it's like to raise money for a nonprofit. You never can look away from what's in front of you because you're gonna get run over. And so everybody is on your development team and if you have an organization in which everybody at the table with the capacity and, and ultimately responsibility to raise money is not, something is wrong. Push, don't pull. This is, of course, a lesson of the technology business. They believe in push, whether it's pushing things to your, the home screen of your smartphone as opposed to making you go find them or what, what have you. We don't sit around every day waiting for the mail to come, waiting for checks to roll in. We don't wait for membership to come in. We don't wait for corporations to discover us through word of mouth. We are aggressive as hell, and this, again, maybe is like the for-profit world, in prospecting. We really think of it almost as a director of sales position as much as anything else. Traditional for-profit function. We are constantly prospecting for new business. We're constantly cold calling. We're constantly sending out mailers. We're constantly going to people where they live, not waiting for them to come to us. Because the only way that you can succeed at this is if you are going to people where they live. We work longer hours than our parents did, and there are more things distracting our attention than have ever existed in, our, in, in the lives of people like us before. What we all suffer from in this world these days is time poverty, right? Time poverty. And so with so many things in front of us all the time, you can't rely on people to organically come to you. You've got to be much more aggressive in going to them. Push, not pull. And I, I really took this to heart after talking to a lot of technology people about their sales operations, their software sales operations. You really have got to cold call prospect as if you're in a for-profit business. To that end, okay, uh, what are people giving the Tribune money for? My charming face? No. The mission in the abstract? Sort of. No, what they're doing is buying the product. And this is, again, an interesting, it's an interesting transformation of the way you think. What you all who run nonprofits do is you, are, you produce a product. Now, it's a different product, but it's a product. And I know that some people go, oh, product, that's such a, it's like a business term. It's a manufacturer, ugh, it's a manufacturer. No, it's a product. What you have is a product. It is the realization of your mission. So if you're Jack Noakes and you run the Austin Museum of Art, the exhibitions you mount the work you do in the community on arts education, that is your product. 
And when people are making a donation to the museum, what they're doing is saying, we like the product. We're buying the product. Well, the Tribune's content is the product. That's what people are buying. I mean, I don't, I appreciate the fact that they're giving us charity. They feel good about the community in Texas is so great. We're going to support them. No, they're buying the product. They, they look at the work we're doing and they go, we think this is good, we think this is good work. We, we, we support this work. If the work was not there, if the work was not good, if the amount of it was not sufficient, if it was not robust, if it was not executed well, if it did not live up to all the promises that we made, no donations. No matter how good the idea is, everything is in the execution. Everything is in the product. You've got to orient yourself to think about yourself. You're producing a product. And you're selling that product to your donors. And your donors are going to buy it or not. And that's going to tell you, by the way, whether your product is good. If you don't generate the fundraising that you thought you were going to, you've got to ask yourself, do I have the right product? It's not a failure of personnel. It may be a failure of product. And I think that's something that's hard to accept, but it's ultimately very often true. I alluded to collaboration before. I'm a huge proponent of collaboration. We all, the media is, this is a perfect distillation of the, of the view I have of the media, but I think it probably applies across the board with all of you. We are in a world today where you can hang separately or survive together, right? And we, we can stand on ceremony, oh, that's my rival, that's my competition. They're in the same space I'm in. I can't possibly partner with them or collaborate with them. But the reality is that today, none of us could afford to be so standoffish about competition. In fact, it's entirely possible, if not certain, that you can do more in league with that other organization than you could have independent of them. That one plus one ends up equaling more than either of you could have done independently. One plus one equals more than two. In our case, that's meant going to the newspapers and going to other media organizations around the state and saying, how do we work together to advance the cause of public service journalism? Our reporters and your reporters are throwing in together, uh, putting money in the same pot to commission a poll. Can we do events together? How can we work together? Oh, but, but, but we're, co we're competitors. Oh, stop that. You know, once upon a time, we had the luxury of thinking of one another as competitors. We could afford to think of ourselves as competitors, but we can't afford that anymore. Today, you got to figure out all kinds of new strategies to work together. What AMOA is doing with Art House, I think, is a great example of people who had historically viewed themselves as competitors, realizing that the collaboration mentality is much more likely the route to success these days than standing you know, in the same boxes with the same boundaries. You know, on the Austin Film Society board for many years, I kept saying to Rebecca Campbell, who was a magnificent executive director of the Film Society, you've got to figure out a way to extend an olive branch to Barbara Morgan at the Austin Film Festival, because this, this is like the Bloods and the Crips. It makes no sense. <laughs> it makes no sense for these two organizations with shared missions and shared visions to be standing on the other side of the street hissing at each other and throwing cherry bombs. You've got to figure out a way to work together, because in collaboration, the really important and great work of the world comes. Our partnership with the New York Times has been magnificent in terms of what it's done for us and what it's done for them. For them, this was a circulation play when they came to us. They said, look, we're watching our circulation diminish the way it's diminishing every place. We think that if there's Texas content produced by Texans on a regular basis that we can brag about on the cover with a sticker twice a week, that our existing subscribers will continue to subscribe and that we'll build our new circulation. Even if we don't build new, flat is the new up, right? <laughs> Even if we don't build new, what we want to do is retain, retain our existing circulation. So this is going to be great. Well, it's been so great for them. They've done everything they wanted and more. And from our perspective, it's been great for us from a brand building standpoint, which, by the way, is the next thing. Humility is for wimps. I have been in nonprofit organizations where they say, oh, we can't really brag about what we do. It's not right gauche for us to be immodest. And I don't want to build the brand. It's just this, this seems so inappropriate. No, no. Your brand is everything. And bragging is right and appropriate. And it's the root to all good things. You can't, you can't sit back, oh, I'm so humble. I can't possibly do. We don't want to have a publicist. That would be so gauche. No, no. 
the, 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 we, we constantly, we deluge people with the stuff that we do. And I am unashamed of that. Every time somebody says, emails me, for Christ's sake, stop sending me stuff. I think victory. This is great. <laughs> And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. The, the world that we live in today, you've got to hit people 15 times over the head before they notice, before the bump develops. And you have a lot of great work that you're doing. You ought to be very proud to brag about it. Hell yes, get a publicist. Dave knows. We have a publicist named Elaine Garza, whose uh, agency, Giant Noise, which is here in Austin, represents a whole lot of nonprofits. They do a magnificent job of taking the nonprofit work that gets done, and they push it out to the, to the traditional media and to the community in a way that gets you amazing attention and amazing funds. Because people go, oh, well, I've got to give money to Tribune. They're cool. Well, look at the work they're doing. They're great. I mean, fabulous. I would put my life in this woman's hands. I never appreciated before the value of being so immodest as I do now. Well, maybe a little bit. Um, but I'm telling you, this, this is, again, out of the for-profit world, you would never hesitate in the for-profit world to just go crazy on building your brand and bragging about everything you do and just being relentless and shameless about it. And yet, in the, you get to the nonprofit world, people go, oh, I couldn't possibly. No, yes, you could possibly. And you should possibly. And then this is the last one. And then with the questions for the rest of the time. The person who gives me $5 is as important to me as the person who gives me $5 million. In fact, in some ways, the person who gives me $5 is more important to me than the person who gives me $5 million. Because the person who gives me $5 million is probably not going to give me $5 million again. But the person who gives me $5 might. And the person who gives me $5 is the organic, grassroots level support that any organization like ours needs to, needs to succeed. So I am as enthusiastic in my gratitude for the person who gives us $5 as I am for the person who gives us $5 million. I make no distinction between the two. Donor service is how we traditionally think of, in the nonprofit world, the, what I'm describing. But I really think of it in a for-profit sense as customer service. The person who gives me $5 is my customer. The person who gives me $5 million is my customer. The person who gives me nothing and reads the Tribune is my customer. The, the obnoxious commenter on Facebook is my customer. And so my view is you, you service that customer with gratitude and respect and enthusiasm in the way that you would if you were selling tires or car parts, right? It's no different than a for-profit business. Customer service is job one, first, last, and always. Those people allow you to do all these other things. I, I have been a donor to nonprofits, just like not a, ones I'm on the board of, of course, but. You know, Julia and I will say, well, I think this nonprofit is doing a good job, and so let's give them a check. And then nothing happens. You don't hear from them. You don't get a phone call. You don't get an email. You don't get asked for anything. It's just sort of like the money goes into a void. Well, what, you who've run nonprofits, you who've been in that situation before, what happens? You don't make that same mistake a second time. You get, that's some, they, that money doesn't go to somebody else. You've got to have a plan in, in place. To, to, to appreciate and to service the people who are your bread and butter, because otherwise there's just no, no doing this. I've talked for way too long. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I have until what time? 1130? Oh, good, okay. Well, I have, I, I will, yeah. Oh, so we have, we have 10, 10 minutes. I mean, I can't believe I'm near closing. This is terrible. Um, yeah, well, uh, but, uh, all right. Well, it's all right. It's okay. So, so, so uh, questions? We, we have a few minutes. Uh, for those of you that have enjoyed watching Evan for, for years, ask other people the hard questions. So here's your chance. So is that okay? Uh, please. Okay. Uh, be really mean. Uh, given your business model, hmm? um, are you not replicating what, what newspapers did when they put their content online for free by providing all the databases for free? Well, we could certainly charge people for our data, and we might one day. You know, I, I actually have a, a personal philosophy that content wants to be free. And, and it's, information wants to be free, but you get other people to, to provide the resources to allow that to be the case. And that's where the real public good uh, uh, comes from. Uh, look, uh, what the newspapers have found is that their massive overhead, their printing presses and their postage and their paper and their bloated staffs and everything else, that's the, the, the weight around their necks. If they were just web-only operations, they could be a lot more nimble and a lot more agile. Their expenses would come way down. Our expenses, relatively speaking, are not that much given the work that we're doing. And obviously, just in a couple of years' time, we've been able to raise as much money as we have. We will be break-even, I'm absolutely sure, 
uh, before the end of next year, which would be ahead of schedule. Um, and so I don't think we're replicating what the newspapers are doing but for the simple fact that we don't have the overhead even approaching uh, uh, what, what they do. And as long as we keep our overhead down, as long as we keep our eyes on the ball, as long as we don't spend money on unnecessary things, only on product, I think we're going to be okay. Are there other states where something like this is going on? You're talking to people in other places. Well, so when we started, the ProPublica was up and running for a couple of years, and that's sort of above us. And then below us, there were two uh, well thought of city uh, nonprofit news organizations Voice of San Diego in San Diego and MinPost in Minneapolis, two cities where the newspapers were on the verge of collapse. I think, in fact, the, the Minneapolis paper is, in fact, in Chapter 11 now. Um, and it's often a market in which there's an opening created by the decline in what was there. Um, since we started, there have been a rush of organizations that have uh, cropped up. Uh, in some cases, very nicely, they've come down to Austin and said, you're the inspiration. Can we come and kick your tires? Will you share all your information with us? Yes, of course. Tell us how you're doing this, of course. And they don't always do it the way we do. We were very deliberate in choosing to be just about public policy, politics, and government. The ones that have tried to be more about the broad array of subjects, arts and sports and everything else, they run into the fact that if, if the newspaper in their hometown is not doing public policy and politics, they're probably still doing high school sports. They're probably still doing arts. They're probably still doing crime on your street. And so it becomes a much more competitive thing. I also think, and this is my Texas Monthly bias showing, and you know, Mike Levy has filled my head with this stuff for all these years. Texas is just different. The, you know, Texas Monthly is approaching, believe it or not, its 40th anniversary of its launch. And in all those years, there's been no other successful statewide magazine in the country. And the reason is Texas is different. In Texas, the connective tissue is Texanness. You don't say I'm from Austin. Well, maybe from Austin you say you're from Austin, but you don't say <laughs> you don't say you're from Dallas or Houston or San Antonio. You say you're from Texas. There's a pride about being from Texas, so that even if something happens elsewhere in the state, not in your community, you inherently care about it. Texas. We always thought of Texas Monthly about Texas as a city, and Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, Houston were the neighborhoods. It has that level of intimacy over a large landmass. Most other states don't feel that way. California is really three different states. LA hates San Francisco. San Francisco hates San Diego. San Diego hates LA. You, we actually owned California Magazine many years ago and almost, it almost destroyed Texas Monthly. It lost $8 million in one year. You cannot do other states that way. And I think that it would be hard to replicate the statewide nonprofit model in a similar way. California Watch, which is a project of the Center for Public Integrity out in Center for Investigative Reporting, pardon me, in California is the only one that is truly like it, statewide. And they're very, very good, but their model is very different. Sir. Let me, let me ask you. Hi. Hi. Uh, let me ask you, I've been a supporter of the Tribune. Thank you. Thank you. As well as the Texas, Obser Texas Observer. And a lot of the things you do are, are very much like the Observer, although yours is a daily and you have a lot more reporters. And, and we're expressly nonpartisan. Exactly. So uh, how would you differentiate between, between the two publications? That, that way, first and foremost. We are not partisan. One, the, I, I, look, I love the Observer. I love what they do. I'm proud of the Observer. Every time I see them do a great big study, they have a wonderful story about for-profit education in Texas, about Pearson and for-profit education that I would encourage any education stakeholders in the, in the room to read. It's a great story that's published right now. They do really good work, but they are partisan. And the problem is we have too much partisanship in this world. We have too much divisiveness in this world. I don't need to have somebody preach aside to me. I want facts and information personally that allow me to go make my own decision. That's not knocking the observer. There's absolutely a place for that. But we chose to go a different way. That's principally the difference. Mr. Shaw. So, we both know that Steve Adler was right. 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 So half of the Capitol press corps is the Texas, uh, is the Texas Tribune right now. Yeah, and a little bit less. One of the benefits of having competition in journalism is, be, is, is that the, the drive to get the scoop, get mm -hmm. the story. Got to get the story. Got to beat the other guy. Yeah. Is there a danger in the Texas Tribune representing too much of the Capitol press corps? Yeah. And, and, and how regarding that? Yes, but I can't fix that. That, that's not on me, that's on them. Houston and San Antonio are the number one population and number two population cities in the state of Texas and number four and number eight in the country. They have a combined three people at the Capitol. We have 16. This is, the, the fact that we're between a third and a half of the press corps is not on us, that's on them. 
And you know, competitively, my attitude about that is it's like the rules of wartime are in effect when your enemy is self-destructing, stand out of the way. <laughs> but on the other hand, Dave, I actually share your concern. During the session, what happens is these organizations staff up. It's like Christmas time at department stores. They hire a bunch of elves. <laughs> and then Christmas is over and they fire all the elves. And so the Perry campaign has actually held off the massive elf unemployment. But during the session, it's a little bit more of a level playing field, closer to where, where a third, say, during the session. And you know, I, I have to give credit where credit is due. The Dallas Morning News and the American Statesman and the Observer really ramped up their coverage of Texas to a degree that we were all out there swinging at the ball together. And it was real competition. It was the most competitive environment that any of us had seen in 20 years. And I loved that. I thought that was magnificent. It was great for Texas. And you know, at the very beginning, people said, how are you going to measure your success? One of the ways we said we would measure our success is if other news organizations step up and play the role that they should, even if they're the ones providing the public service as a consequence of our threat, we win. And so I, I absolutely consider the work that they do to be magnificently important to the state. And I don't, I, I'm, I'm sorry to see them. You know, the Dallas Morning News laying off 38 people this week is not good news for Texas. I don't take any pleasure in that at all. It's bad for Texas. First of all, thanks for that non-partisanship. I mean, I, I agree with you that we have far too much of that in this, in this country, and I appreciate sure. your, your position. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the events that you do? Sure. So the biggest uh, series of events we do is a conversation series um, that happens at the Austin Club uh, when it's in Austin, although it's happened elsewhere in Austin, and now it's beginning to travel out of, out of city of Austin and, and around the country, in which in sort of true accountability journalism fashion, as we define it, we bring elected officials in front of the people who are their constituents and make them answer for the actions that they take or don't take, for the laws that they support or don't support. We grill them for 30 minutes in front of an audience of people, hundreds of people often, and then give the audience an opportunity to ask questions of them for 30 minutes. We've been doing this now since January of 2010. As I said, this morning we had the Republican U.S. Senate candidate Ted Cruz. We'll have John Sharp, the new A&M chancellor, in two weeks. We've got Susan Combs at the beginning of November. We've got uh, uh, Dr. Siguro, the UT chancellor, in Laredo in October, in El Paso in November. The first of a series of these conversations we're going to do at a city, but in their home districts, we're going to have Naomi Gonzalez, Jose Rodriguez, and Dee Margo, the three freshman legislators, on the UTEP campus. We're going to grill them about the public education cuts. We're going to grill them about the higher ed cuts in front of their constituents. These are people who, in most instances, those people are not bad people. I'm not sitting them out. But in most instances, these elected officials have never been asked to answer for themselves in a setting that they did not control in front of their constituents. So we're going to do those monthly between now and the election. And how do you generate revenue? Corporate sponsorship. So the conversation series at the Austin Club, we have four corporate sponsors, AT&T, NRG, BP and Christus Health, the hospital company, each pay us $25,000 a year as the series sponsors. Our expenses at the Austin Club are less than $20,000 a year. So it is a generator of revenue for us. It creates amazing content for us because all those things are videotaped. And from a brand and engagement standpoint, can't be beat. In the old days, before there was audio and video and blogging and everything else, we all got in rooms and talked to each other, right? Real time was the original platform. And we've gotten away from that. And so we believe that with these events, you're bringing people back together to have that conversation in the way that they used to. And we think it's absolutely mission appropriate for us. Maybe one more, is that okay? If there is one more? There you go. I'm sorry. I can't do, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, we uh, uh, can sit and talk for an hour with you. Thank you. Okay, I hope that was all right, good. As usual, inspirational, thank controversial, you, Matt. Okay. Uh, motivational. Controversial. Thank you. I appreciate you very, very much.